A very good evening and good morning to everybody present here. On behalf of the Peninsula Foundation, I welcome you all to today's book discussion on China's Belt and Road Initiative, the impact on sub-regional Southeast Asia. I thank all the panelists and audience members for taking up the time to be here with us today. And I invite Air Marshal M. Mateshwin, the founder and chairman of the Peninsula Foundation, to kindly introduce the panelists for today's discussion. Thank you all. Thank you, Rupal. Uh, uh, good evening to everybody and uh, good morning to Vi Liang in the US. Early morning for her. And uh, it's a great pleasure that we've joined in today uh, for a very excellent uh, you know, discussion on a very, very important topic. China's Belt and Road Initiative, and narrowing down to it, see the impact uh, of this uh, BRI on the sub-regional, uh, you know, Southeast Asia. Uh, this is a book that's just been uh, published in Europe, if I'm right, and uh, the Asian edition or the Southeast edition, uh, if I remember, is planned to be released in early 2022. Uh, on behalf of the Peninsula Foundation, let me welcome our panelists, the authors and the editors of the book. Uh, Christian Ploberger, it's a great pleasure to have you with us today. And Thank along you. with them, Sapa and Ngam Pramuwan. I hope I yeah. pronounced that correctly. Okay. And uh, she's a co-editor with them. And uh, the third editor is, uh, is uh, Tao Song, he's not there. But we have one of the authors of the chapter, Professor Wei Liang from Monterey in California. Uh, Professor William, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. Uh, let me first, uh, you know, give a little bit of uh, introduction on behalf of the first on behalf of the Peninsula Foundation. Let me also welcome all the audience. There are lots of senior veterans and senior uh, academicians and professionals who are very interested. Obviously, that indicates the high level of interest on the topic today, and they're also uh, uh, there. Uh, I uh, would uh, give a little bit of introduction on the. But this is an excellent book. For most of us, uh, you know, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative has captured the imagination of uh, uh, everyone uh, in, uh, across the world. But quite largely, the animated uh, engagement has been on issues of geopolitics and uh, geoeconomics and the fear that China is going to probably take over the world and uh, it's a grand strategy from the Chinese side, and therefore it's going to be a, a major threat to existing global architecture and uh, the, uh, uh, the threat to the rules-based world order, et cetera. Well, uh, one of the American national security strategies uh, or the American uh, uh, study uh, released early this year very clearly defines the BRI as a, a mechanism to create a sinocentric global economic order, uh, economic world order. So, we, and, and, and very clearly the uh, American system indicates that it is a national security threat as well. Uh, there are countries that are not looked at favorably, particularly from India and Japan, Australia. These are countries that are, you know, uh, have a lot of concerns with respect to BRA because China is pushing in a massive amount of infusing a lot of funds, major ports and infrastructure being developed. The BRA has both the land component and the maritime co component, both features on the old uh, you know, concept of Silk Road engaging in trade, commerce and infrastructure. Uh, but what is more interesting is uh, I believe this is a real marker for a transformation of the international order because economics is at the core of it and, in, and integration and global trade is at the core of it. So this book, uh, you know, authored by uh, uh, excellent, uh, you know, uh, uh, academicians and researchers and, uh, uh, and professionals goes into identifying the uh, real crux of the BRI its impact in the context of regionalization or regional impact going down to sub-regional impact in the context of greater Mekong region. The Mekong uh, Lansang River is uh, the third largest, the third longest river in the world. And I believe uh, in terms of biodiversity, it is uh, probably the second best in the world next to Amazon. And 4,800 kilometers long, it, it traverses through 
uh, originates in China, travels through Myanmar, uh, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and uh, Vietnam. And uh, the river also forms borders for you know, the significant number of these countries, which form the central region of the ASEAN formation as well. And therefore, I think when the book looks at the goes into the implications of domestic interest and international interest and regional cooperation, I think it's a very innovative way of analyzing and, and looking at the BRS in fact. And there, I think, is the, the biggest interest that comes about. And I think the authors have done an excellent job. So we would like to hear from the three authors, the overall book editor, Christian Perberger, so, uh, and, uh, uh, and from the Thailand angle, Professor Sopa Nagam Praman will cover uh, her uh, views on that. And from the Laos and the larger dimensions, uh, Professor Wei Liang will cover that. So each of the panelists will take 15 to 20 minutes. We'll go ahead in, in, in that fashion. And I will uh, request the audience to raise your questions on the uh, chat mode. You can also raise your hand subsequently when we open up for the questions. And we will have a very, very uh, interesting discussion on this entire process. Uh, certainly, everybody will still look at it from the geopolitics and geoeconomic angle. But I think this uh, you know, analysis would be very, very interesting. So let me hand it over to Christian Proberger. Uh, Christian, all yours. Please take over. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, first, thank you for the invitation, for the opportunity to be here today and to talk and to discuss uh, our book, which was a cooperative uh, project. Uh, my part will be uh, to introduce the book, to have some words, some short words about the Berlin Roll Initiative and uh, provide some information about the chapters the presenter cannot be with us. So let's have a start. Uh, China's Berlin Roll Initiative. I mean, I don't need to repeat all the standard things because all of us have some familiarity. But nevertheless, let's have a look just on the map so to, to see the dimension of it, to see the extent of it. It's going from East Asia to Central Asia to the Middle East uh, to Central Europe uh, to reach the Atlantic. So it's a huge uh, undertaking from the north-south dimensions going down uh, to Southeast Asia, to India, and then on to Africa. Uh, in doing such a project, or in doing have such a focus, a lot of challenging coming. But there's also another way how to look to it, like uh, that's something uh, produced by the World Bank. You see the, the link be below. Uh, that's present the Build and Road Initiative uh, based on different overland corridors. So to provide a more focused picture, but nevertheless, also in this, foc in this more focused picture, uh, based on economic corridors supported by the Berlin Roll Initiative, we see the huge dimension of it. And, but with our book, we are going to focus on some specific aspects, but nevertheless, uh, some further aspect related to it. Let's have an uh, international, yes, perspective on it, because from an international perspective, Bell and Roll Initiative offers a strong indication of China's newfound national strength, because without the success of the reform process, and we have to remember it's an extraordinary economic success, it wouldn't have the economic muscles, the economic power of doing, of instigating the Bell and Roll Initiative. So it's an indication of its successful transformation from a previous Maoist system to a more uh, advanced communist system, because it's still a communist system. It didn't become a democratic system. I mean, everyone knows this. In doing so, like as the map showed from the World Bank, uh, Bell and Roll Initiative does supports economic corridors in different regional setting. In Southeast Asia, in Central Asia, uh, some parts of uh, South Asia, like Pakistan. Also, there is some reach into uh, Middle East via Central Asia and into connection to Europe. So uh, it's again this wide approach what this has. But nevertheless, it's coming down to some regional setting. Basically, 
spelled in roles initiative enhance infrastructure connectivity. It contributes to the integration of economic space. We should not forget infrastructure is the first step to an integrated economic space. I mean, if you think on Southeast Asia, when I, was I now from my travel through the Mekong region, when you came down the Yunnan province uh, and reaching the china Lao border, that's where the Chinese motorway stops. Then if you go to Northern Thailand, Chiang Ra, Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai, to the Burmese China, Myanmar border, there's also uh, where the, Wait a moment, what's coming up? Just a second. Yes. Okay, now I can see my screen again. Um, there's also the, uh, the first class road connection ends there. So there's a missing link of 200 kilometers, but once this is closed, then you can drive on the motorway from Beijing to Singapore. The safe implication or to the railway system, where way is uh, uh, talking more about uh, uh, regarding Laos. So is this is contribution to, an in, to integrate economic space and also in other parts like Central Asia. It's a similar effect of Bell and Road initiatives of the investment associated with it. But nevertheless, in doing so, it also strengthens China regional and global position. Because in doing so, in providing the investment, China became an important political actor in different regional settings. No question about that. So it's enhanced the China's uh, influence. But there's also a domestic aspect, especially from a China view. And this is very often ignored. Like when you said uh, in your opening statement that America is interpreting Belt and Roll Initiative as a global political economic security challenge. If you look to the basic document, which is guiding and to the basic policy, which underlines Belt and Roll Initiative, there's a huge emphasis on, the, on addressing domestic challenges within China. But this is very often uh, or almost ignored in the international view on the Belt and Roll Initiative. And this is also why in, the, in our book, we have uh, two contributors who again can, cannot be with us today, uh, who wrote about Yunnan and Guangxi uh, province. So who, who presents his specific focus on, on the, on the, from the domestic perspective, from Chinese domestic perspective. Because after all, despite the huge success of China, it still face a development challenge. A development challenge between the highly developed and successful coastal provinces and then some rem uh, remote area, remote provinces. And it needs to be addressed because this imbalance of economic developments, this imbalance of life opportunities within China does make the pressure on the communist leadership. So that's the issue they have to sort. And Bell and Roll Initiative is one attempt of doing so. And what is also important and also mentioned in the guiding document in the, in the guidelines that despite Belt and Road Initiative provides a huge financial support for new projects, but they are still following up earlier uh, attempts. So in this way, I would argue that uh, Belt and Road Initiative is an umbrella for uh, a huge variety of different political strategies the Chinese government is following at the same time and is re-evaluating on earlier uh, policy. So the project are new, the engagement with different regions are not used, new. So in this way, you can say there is a kind of new aspect of Bell and Road Initiative and a very strong continuation of previous policy strategies. However, let's go more forward. That's our book. And you're welcome. You can order it. It's published by Rutledge. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's focused on sub-regional Southeast Asia, also known as the Mekong area. So in that is uh, uh, where we decided to focus on a specific area and not, not just take a global view, have a more specific look on, the, on, a, on a specific regional setting and to have an evaluation, um, what are the impact of it, impact of it, and how people from within the different countries thinking about it. And um, so here you see the map. That's the, the map uh, represents the area our book is dealing with, and it's also including the, the two 
uh, Chinese provinces of Yuan and Guangxi. So the books provide three levels of investigation. The first one is on a sub-regional level. So focus on sub-regional Southeast Asia or Mekong region. Uh, the second level, level is on the domestic aspect of the countries involved in it. So on Laos, Cambodia, uh, so Cambodia uh, Thailand, and uh, the two Chinese provinces. And that's the third level. So the, the, two the focus on, on the domestic aspect represents the third level within the book. So we have a sub-regional, a county level, and the domestic level. So in this way, we aimed to focus and address uh, in a comprehensive way, but within a specific regional setting. So the book is not saying anything about Central Asia. So, the, but this was delivered. This was our aim to focus on one specific area. So let's have a closer look to the sub-regional focus. Regional economic integration represents the process of contextualizing space. As I said, it's a, it's a way of bringing uh, economies together, of integrating different national economies when possible in a wider context. Regional integration process does offer, if it's successful, a long-term support for local development. Like in the Mekong region, we already have some we already see some uh, success story of that uh, because part of the Mekong region became, uh, is now integrated in the global production network. I mean, it's now challenged by COVID-19, but that's the case before. I mean, we, we still have to see how COVID-19 uh, will impact on global production network in the long time. In the short time, it was very devastating, the impact, but let's see how it's be settled in the long term. But regional uh integration processes are trying to get econom uh, to, de to develop economic power and strength to participate in global in the global economy yet at the same time the success generated by cooperation on the regional sub-regional level generates pressure on natural and energy resources which in turn may enhance the possibility of resource competition about the countries so on the one hand, you say you have a success story with sub-regionalism, but, but on the rising demand of energy, on the rising demand of natural resources, the country within, uh, so the member of a sub-regional integration process may see, uh, see themselves more uh, being in a kind of competition, which may then undermine the cooperation. It's not to say it's already happened in the Mekong area, but we, when we look to it, on the challenge of natural resources, on the challenge how to, to distribute the water resources of the Mekong. There are very clear indication of it. And like from the conception aspect, chapter two, what I wrote, uh, focus on, on the Mekong region, identifying the Mekong region uh, as a focus point for cooperation is also some aspect what so uh, up in, in here general work is doing, focusing on the Mekong and uh, sub-regional cooperation, because basically as an international river person, it provides a particular geographic and structural context for cooperation. Uh, I mean, in, other, in, a, in, a, in a different work, what we did, we compared the Danube region and the Mekong, because Danube also represents the international river person. Uh, that, this inter that there is an international river person, to provide such a context can also be seen by the GMS project, so by the Great Mekong Subregion project, supported by the ADP, then by the Bell and Roll Initiative and the Lankang Mekong Cooperation. Of course, the last two ones are connected now from China, but the GMS project uh, from the Asian Development Bank, it's already very well established, started around 1992. So here we see they also recognized very early on the potential for cooperation. And basically, when we recognize this, uh, we also see the lasting relevance of region and sub-region in international politics. I mean, in, in South India, there is this um, sub-regional uh, integration is uh, for the time being rather slowed down because of the political military uh, conflict between Pakistan and India. So this, uh, the, uh, the cooperation forum uh, 
is not working at the moment, but that's uh, because of the conflict situation. But we, we see regional and sub-regional cooperation all over the globe, to some extent, more successful or less successful. So therefore, it's, it's an indication, indication of the ongoing relevance of uh, to take a regional or sub-regional focus. At the same time, proximity takes a specific meaning in the positive way, because to share economic power, to share economic cooperation, but like this, as mentioned this before, with the pressure on resources, it so may also have a negative uh, aspect proximity. And that also uh, brings to the chapter three, which was written uh, with rising energy demand. Already said before, but the author of this chapter emphasizing the challenge of providing enough energy for the whole subregion because they assess that um, the energy demand because of the success of the reform process. So it's 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 not a short it's a shortcoming. It's the indeed the success of the cooperation which drives the energy demand. And between 2017 and 2015, the demand will triple. And so therefore, there's a huge pressure of generating the energy to support the ongoing economic development. Um, on the same, at the same time, Cambodia and Myanmar still have a challenge to provide enough ele electricity to rural communities, to bring the rural communities on the grid network. So here we see the double challenge. On the one hand, there's, they're moving on in economic cooperation, becoming part of the uh, global production network. On the other hand, basic aspects of providing the rural community with electricity, it's, it's still uh, a challenge. I mean, this was also, the assessment was done before the military takeover in Myanmar, which uh, complicated the situation even more. So addressing energy shortage is a crucial, is also crucial for work on production migration. migration. For example, the, the author from Cambodia uh, also makes the point, uh, if there's not enough energy, like in Laos or Cambodia, then we company moving to Thailand, where there is more energy available. So this means a move of um, a migration of worker, but also of companies. So therefore, here you see the, the wider context of energy. But at the same time, the author of chapter three do hope that sub regional cooperation does offer the opportunity to work together, like to share electricity in a, in a regional wide grid network. But they say that's something on the future, but they, they, and they, pro, uh, they will provide a lot of data uh, in their chapter. So if you get the book, if you buy it, uh, you can see, see the data what they are providing for it. Uh, so, and they hoping that sub regional cooperation also have a positive uh, effect in building up a shared grid network, a shared electricity network within uh, uh, the Mekong area. Let's move on to the country focus. I mean, I'm not going to speak too much or almost nothing about Thai, Thailand and Laos because the two co presenters will uh, evaluate the two cases on their own, but maybe some words uh, to investment in Cambodia because he, uh, the out of it cannot be here because he has other commitment. We were hoping he come, but it wasn't possible. So if you look on Cambodia on the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, Cambodia shows an opportunity for attracting investment, for accelerating national development and addressing national development challenges like infrastructure development. So there was a clear positive attitude from the Cambodian government to get Bell and Road Initiative project done in Cambodia. Uh, China be also became a major investor in the agriculture sector after the Cambodian government opened the agriculture sector for foreign investment. Because the idea was again, not just China, but to get foreign investor into Cambodia, in the agriculture area, to support rural community, to hope to reduce rural poverty. And that's happened to some extent. So, because it's also important to recognize there was a step forward by the Cambodian government 
because American me would say, oh, the Chinese overrun them, pressed them. I mean, they took opportunity of it, like Vietnam took opportunity of investment in uh, rural uh, Cambodia. But it was based on the strategy formally by the Cambodian government to address poverty in rural uh, Cambodia. At the same time, even the Cambodian government do recognize there are issues with project implementation re related to Belt and Road Initiative. But uh, the author stated that in, in his opinion and in, in what he can follow on Cambodian government policy, that there's the impression within Cambodia that China is serious in addressing such shortcoming of project implementation. So and this is a positive in the context of getting the investment and getting done as agreed on it. Uh, another interesting aspect, uh, what was what is mentioned in his uh, chapter on Cambodia is because China's non-interfering policy in domestic affairs is also an important aspect for the Cambodian government to be engaged with China. So it's not like the European Union or America, who I think this was a half year ago, who even stopped uh, some investment because of the terrible human rights issue in Cambodia. So from a democratic process, you can say this was the right move. But if you think on the government, if you think on uh, potential economic development, their response was say, okay, if you make pressure on us, we can go to someone else. I mean, in the long term, you say, uh, it maybe would be helpful to have some way of influencing uh, to get the, a better human uh, right record in Cambodia, but for the time being, uh, the Cambodian government also favor China investment because they now they will not be challenged on this aspect from China because of China say we do not get involved in domestic issues. Uh, and I'm coming to the end, so I think I'm still within 20 minutes. Uh, the, the next level, uh, we are the where the speaker cannot be here either, it's on the Chinese domestic focus. And there are two provinces, Yunnan province, excuse me. Uh, it's Yunnan province and uh, Guangxi province, because there are two active uh, Chinese, I mean, there are more active Chinese provinces, but the two are very active in the context of sub region Southeast Asia and connected to the Mekong region. So the outdoor of, from Yunnan province, uh, well, in general, we can assess that Yunnan had a long established interest in strengthening, deepening integration with Southeast Asia. Belt and Road Initiative offered a central government support for that. Because basically Yunnan, which is now the famous thing as a bridge to Southeast Asia, which is associated with Belt and Road Initiative, original, this, uh, aspect, this characterization of a bridge, it's developed already back in the 1990s on the provincial co context. At that time, so the provincial government of Yunnan in the 1990s already thought, we want to be a bridge, for, for, uh, Chinese bridge to Southeast Asia, to the Mekong countries. But at that time, they didn't have any central government support. So nothing happened at that time. So here again, Bell and Roll Initiative takes advantage of some local emphasis, which have been already existed before. Because we should remember when we think on Yunnan on the geographic uh, level, Yunnan is closer, I think it's closer to Bangkok than to the East Coast of China. So from the economic perspective, building up the infrastructure, get closer integrated in the Mekong area, which makes, makes, makes much more sense, uh, then on the long distance to China's east coast. So they are closer there. So closer cooperation cares also this cares the prospect for supporting provincial development within Yunnan. And we have to remember that Yunnan belongs to the more, to the rather underdeveloped provinces within China, because for a very long time it was one of the so-called uh, borderland area where nobody wanted to invest much because the border were sealed. So there was no emphasis of opening the border to the Mekong countries, uh, into Southeast Asia. So therefore there were no much investment coming to uh, Yunnan. And this is now changing because now 
it's also from central, was from the Beijing, uh, from Beijing aspect, from a central government aspect in China. It's now is this emphasis of that Yunnan is having such a function as a bridge to Southeast Asia. And in doing so, in having the policy, in being recognized by the central government as a bridge function, changed Yunnan's position among the Chinese provinces. It became now a much more important political actor. So it's not just the, uh, the local economic development, it's also in the, in the context of other Chinese provinces, uh, Yunnan became more, I mean, to some extent, more relevant in political terms. So that's another trade off for the, for the province when we take the provincial view into it. So here we see uh, the relevance for domestic aspect within China and you know, in the provincial level. In a similar story, we now from, uh, we can uh, portray from Guangxi because Guangxi bordering also on, uh, on the Mekong region, not direct on the Mekong, not like Yunnan because the Mekong or Langkang is running through Yunnan, but it's pouring to the area because you have a border with Vietnam, Northern Vietnam. And so therefore Guangxi also see itself uh, uh, the prospect of helping to integrate parts of Southern China, of the coastal area with, within the China ASEAN cooperation via Vietnam and in, in building up the infrastructure project. So therefore there's a, also strong provincial government support for implementing Belt and Road Initiative related policies, because they also see a strong advantage from the provincial level. And especially in enhanced cross-border infrastructure and industry cluster development. That's uh, what they see, which is an uh, outcome of Belt and Road Initiative. So they are another example of how they see it. But again, can you see the, the relevance? It's a completely different story, a completely different narrative than if you say of a global security challenge. So that's a regional economic consideration. And again, uh, even before Bell and Road Initiative became active, became, uh, was created in 2013 or something, there were earlier provincial sub regional cooperation. Uh, within southern China, like the Baipu Gulf economic zone. So in this way, and they are continuing. So here again, here's pre, which is coming, which is, uh, offer another push for already existing cooperation for uh, projects. So, and in this context, in offering this, uh, this link to Vietnam and to the ASEAN countries, because um, some in Kung see even talking to build up the link uh, to Singapore. So they have this as a, as a context in economic cooperation. So for them, Kung see offers, uh, uh, sorry, Belt and Road Initiative offers the opportunity of pos uh, pos position Kung see as a transit hook, internal and external, within the wider context of sub, sub regional Southeast Asia. And um, internal because it uh, represents itself as a link to other Chinese provinces who want to, to do business with, uh, with the ASEAN and with the Mekong region. So once again, a very strong uh, focus from within the domestic aspect, from a provincial aspect within it. Good, and here I'm coming to the end. And I would say, what, where we are? Thank you so far. And I would give over to the other two presenter, but maybe the host wants to say something. Okay, thank you, Christian. So the importance of provincial development and the interweaving of uh, China's uh, lesser developed provinces of Yunnan and Guangxi Autonomous Region into the Southeast Asian uh, economies is a very intelligent process. And therefore, that makes it very clear that the BRI is a continuation of lots of other work that's been done over the years in terms of the Greater Mekong sub-region and other integration, uh, uh, other cooperative developments that have taken place. Uh, that's a very interesting, you know, uh, analysis. Uh, Christian uh, has a very interesting uh, uh, background. He is from Austria, and we met in Hong Kong first, uh, and he's 
an academic, uh, independent academic researcher, currently is lecturing in Tamasat University in Bangkok. But more importantly, he's been traveling in Southeast Asia and China for the last three decades. And I believe he's traveled on cycle, he's done cycling to the extent of 40,000 kilometers in China. So that's a great experience on the ground. Uh, Thirteen thousand. I traveled forty thousand kilometers and thirteen thousand with the bicycle. Bicycle, okay. Yeah. Ten thousand is okay. Yeah. <laughs> Don't push yeah. it too far. <laughs> okay. Uh, we now come to the uh, next, uh, you know, uh, uh, author and presenter, uh, Professor Savapa uh, uh, Nagam Pramona. Come on. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. He is a uh, the uh, professor in the Faculty of Political Science at Ramkang Ramkamang University in Bangkok, Thailand. She is also a, a research, uh, I mean, a visiting professor at the Tokyo in the University in Japan, and she specializes on ASEAN and the global governance and and of course uh, Thailand uh, uh, and China you know, relations as well. Now, Thailand has had a major role in this entire sub-regional development process. And I think that needs to be understood. The greater Mekong sub-region has been pushed primarily by Thailand and has been able to get the kind of acceptance and support from China and other ASEAN countries is, is uh, very impressive. But more importantly, in 2016, they got the uh, Lansang Mekong uh, cooperation uh, process underway. And therefore, the first one of uh, the Greater Mekong uh, subregion, Lansang Mekong Corporation, and BRI, all three complement each other. And Thailand's uh, 40 Development Program is a great supporter of the BRI as well. And therefore, its relations with uh, China is uh, is a crucial aspect of this entire development process. So, let me invite uh, Professor Ngam Pramuan to address uh, her. Uh, chapter and uh, her analysis of the sentai process. All yours. Thank you very much, doctor. And um, okay, I will share my screen. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. And also good morning to work in America. And uh, for this uh, part, I, uh, I will present my part in the individual country focus in Thailand and Thailand 4.0 development strategy in the context of Belt and Road Initiative. First of all, I would like to uh, show that this article in my book, in this book, is a part of uh, research that have been funded by the Research Institute of Thailand and also support by the Institute of the Geographic Science and Natural Research, uh, research of the Chinese Academy of Science in Beijing that invited me to be a researcher of uh, their project in the BRI and the uh, development from 2019 to 2020. This research also employ quantitative and qualitative method to study the significances and implication of the Chinese investment in the Eastern Economic Corridor in Thailand by using sample of 200 Chinese entrepreneurs in the three provinces in the EEC and 20 policy makers of in Bangkok and in Beijing. And I also like to thank you, uh, Dr. Christian, to invite me to be a co-author of this book after uh, his great presentation, I will focus on my uh, focus point of in Thailand about uh, Thailand and uh, BRI, LM, CLM, uh, LMC and the EEC. This presentation will divide in four parts. The first of all, I will review the Thai, Thai Chinese cooperation in the sub-regional setting, like uh, in the Greater Mekong sub-region for the BRI, Lanshan Mekong cooperation, and also through the EEC. The second, Thailand National Economics and Social Development Plan, or the Thailand 4.0 strategy, and the EEC will be present 
but I will talk about the significance of the BRI on the Eastern Economic Corridor or the EEC. Lastly, I will demonstrate prospect of cooperation supporting Thailand 4.0 strategy through BRI and LMC with the railway speed train. Okay. For the Thai Chinese cooperation with the sub regional setting, while GMS, BRI, MC, and EEC, as the Christian said already, Thailand is the one, and also um, Dr. Marshall said, Thailand also one of the members of the Greater Mekong sub region that initiated in um, early. 1992 and Chinese foreign policy on the grant the policy on friendly neighbor under the LMC and the, and the BRI focused on building cooperation, expanding trade and investment to the member to the to, to country around them. Thailand has become one of the China prime targets for foreign direct investment. LMC is the important sub-regional cooperative mechanism that enable the BRI use the relative small geographical area like the DMS Mekong subregion to bring that member, this another five country, to the cross proximity along the Mekong River, and that with uh, that the CLMV country within the framework of the China Indochina Peninsula Economic Corridor or CPEC. And in the meantime, Thailand like to be the hub of ASEAN for ex on the attracting FDI from Japan, South Korea, or from India to uh, EU or to Oceania. And the CPEC is a part of new South Road Economic Bell, right? Which is become recognized in 2013 uh, at the Christian present and also a corridor between Zhujiang River Delta and the Mekong Basin. The CPEC aims to combine economic development and, and infrastructure development to develop, to develop economic area to the Mekong region. And Thailand one also to, uh, sorry, and, and Thailand want to also support, uh, uh, to, uh, to support the Thailand 4.0 policy to the promote the uh, EEC area through the LMC and also BRI for the benefit to stimulating trade and investment from China and other area. And EEC is a function at the sub-regional mechanism as well for enhancing sub-regional trade and attracting FDI for in product system in the local cities in the, in the local area in the special economic zone, including three provinces of the eastern seaboard of Thailand. Uh, sorry. Okay. And from this one, you can see like um, Thailand want to be the hub of the, of the Southeast Asia and also want to promote FDI, especially from China to Thailand. From my research that aim to exploring the impact of the Chinese investment through the LMC to the EEC in Thailand under the Thailand 4.0. So the survey revealed that during the first five years, you can see in the uh, after before the LMC uh, establishment, you can see the small number of the Chinese company or Chinese entrepreneur in the three provinces of the EEC at the Chacheng Sao, Chumburi and Rayong. But after uh, the establishment of L, uh, BRI, the LMC, you can see the significantly increased number year upon year, especially uh, the year 2019, that show the Chinese investor have increased the most at the establishment of Thai Chinese Industrial Park in Rayong province. At that, um, Chinese Industrial Park offer a lot of privilege and investment benefits to to the Chinese investor in Thailand, and especially for the uh, 
Thailand policy, uh, Thailand easy policy. So the Thai government like to provide greater facilitation for the Chinese entrepreneur and also investor in the EEC, especially for the labor skill development, uh, more services for infrastructure, utility to facilitate the operation of the factory and the uh, basic uh, need of the Chinese investment. So this is show the success of the EEC through the uh, through the Thailand 4.0 strategy under the framework of LMC and the BRI. And for the next uh, success of Thailand and um, China later that the prospects for cooperation for support Thailand 4.0 through the infrastructure development that is Thai, Thai Chinese high speed railway project. The cooperation with China, win, uh, this cooperation with China win, will enable Thailand to receive knowledge transfer on high speed railway system, the high speed uh, trend project on the Lanshan Cooperation Program will import technology, innovation, and modern techno uh, knowledge to Thailand. And also for China, China want to grow in uh, pragmatic in handling uh, huge and sensitive project with Southeast Asia, especially for Thailand. As the president, she said, China would like to open more and uh, have more rules and green. For example, like a China, China's willing to work with the third party to carry out the, um, the, the high-speed railway project. And also Beijing like to want to listening more on the non-governmental sector that it never been before. So for uh, this, uh, create the cooperation between um, Thailand and uh, China through the high-speed railway link from the Kunming city in Yunnan province in southwest China that Christian present already that this uh, the true in Yunnan and uh, Sichuan province are joy um, the Greater Mekong subregion and also the Lanshang Mekong Corporation. The high-speed Fly first began in 2010, but the MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, just signed after BRI, signed in 2014. And the main deal of the phase one, I will show later, for the 14 contract that has been just signed later. And the work in Thailand for the first uh, for the first 3.5 kilometer sector from the bank, uh, from the uh, Kora province, uh, the first provinces of Thailand in the northeast of Thailand to Bangkok just start in December 2017. This is the, the, the route of the train that link, you know, um, Thai, Bangkok to uh, China and also wire and Pan Pacific Railway of East Coast Leo Ring uh, in Malay and Indonesia. You know, and uh, for this one is also the link of uh, MPAC Master Pan of ASEAN for like to link uh, the mainland of East Asia through China. And Dr. Christian said Yunnan one is the bridge is the bridge of um, Thailand and mainland of East Asia. This one uh, will link also link with the uh, Laos, uh, you know, link um, Yunnan to Vientiane, the capital city of Laos, and also to Bangkok and also to the Ho Chi Minh city. There are three lines and another line link between uh, Bangkok, you know, through uh, uh, Kunming to, to Vientiane, to Bangkok, to the EEC, uh, Eastern Seaboard area around in Utapau, this way on the East West, uh, East West corridor of economic corridor in the, on the GMS. From this one, from the north, uh, from the Yunnan province, from the north of um, Thailand, via Chiang Mai, 
Vientiane to Singapore is a north-south economic corridor of the Greater Mekong subregion. And this one also will link to Singapore and Indonesia as well. This one will link at the Kunming Vientiane, link with the Kunming Vientiane Railroad. That just be commit. I just talked to Professor Wei and she said the, the railroad from the Kunming to Vientiane just completed two days ago. But first, it's set to complete uh, like um, the beginning of this year, but it's delayed because of um, uh, the pandemic and also, um, you know, uh, uh, a little bit, you will, you will, you will uh, hear later with the professor's uh, word about the BRI and the Lao. So, this one, this is um, the, uh, that that one. This is a whole link. But for in Thailand, you know, the first Lan uh, Chang Mekong, the MC Thailand announced that the first um, Thai Chinese double track railway will be built for the 875 kilometers that I said. Uh, in Thailand, we will link from the northern e northeast of Thailand through the Nakhon Si, from Nong Khai, right? Udon Thani Khon Gan, through Nakhon Si Tamarat, that now starting already for, but it's quite a bit delayed right now. And also through uh, Ayutthaya, Bangkok, and this and another part I told you, for the Cha Cheung South Chumburi Rayong in EEC province. And with the map to put is the Eaton uh, seaboard and also link three, uh, three, hang on, link another three uh, airport of Thailand. Another one trend link um, uh, from airport from Utapau from Chonburi province through uh, Suwanapum Airport in Thailand. I'll also link through the Don Mung Airport. This is the, the lead, uh, second phase of um, Thai speed, Thai Chinese speed railway. And from now on, the um, Thai government just uh, signed the uh, three contacts in the early two thousand uh, March 2021 with the um, Thai China Speed Railway and estimate to uh, build for 255, but haven't finished yet. And uh, another contract, you know, contract will uh, link to uh, Bangkok and another three, uh, three airport in Thailand. It, it hasn't finished as well, but it's still on, on, uh, ongoing process. This is the um, trend. It's called Fuxing EMU. You know, that is the will be the challenge of the BRI in Southeast Asia. The overall project now in the, how to say, uh, in the obstacle, and there are some uh, problems. So the um, the researcher, you know, just found that BRI should be more uh, transparent. Um, Chinese government should be provide more transparent and also uh, more public uh, diplomacy to explain about the problem to the media and also let uh, uh, provide more facilitator to stakeholder and also. Uh, let the public can accept to more information, you know. And this is the uh, all impact of um, Thailand under the EEC with the Thailand strategy for 0 with the LMC, Lan Chang Mekong Corporation under the Belt and Road Initiative. Thank you very much. Okay, I will stop Thank sharing. Thank you, Professor. That's, I think, uh, an excellent. Uh, uh, let me now for invite uh, Professor William. Uh, she holds the uh, uh, Gordon Paul Smith Chair for International Policy and Management in the School of International Policy and Management at Monterey Institute of International Relations. That's the Middlebury Institute of uh, International Studies at Monterey, uh, California in the US. 
Uh, Professor Bailey, uh, welcome. It's yours now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you again uh, for the opportunity uh, to speak uh, and share our research projects with you today. And uh, uh, thanks for the invitation. I am going to share slides now. And uh, uh, hopefully I will be able to stop sharing now. I'm worried about stop sharing already. <laughs> um, so uh, in the interest of time, I am going to be very brief. Hopefully we will be able to you know, uh, have a, a, a plenty of time for the discussion. I very much look forward to it. The chapter I'm uh, presenting today is a, a chapter I contributed to the book and uh, which has a focus on China's BRI projects in uh, Laos. And uh, um, the central question I asked in that chapter actually is, uh, I'm going to uh, skip a few slides, is that uh, I, the central question I'm asking in this chapter is uh, why the Laotian government has been so accommodating, you know, uh, uh, in terms of uh, not only it's a policy support, but also in terms of its, uh, uh, you know, uh, overall um, attitude towards uh, uh, China's BRI, different from uh, many other countries in the region of Southeast Asia, like uh, what Christian and uh, Jojo have uh, uh, shared, you know, uh, a lot of controversies, a lot of, uh, you know, the call from the society for transparency and for, uh, you know, uh, a more public diplomacy. But if you look at the, the survey conducted by uh, Singapore, actually, uh, in terms of uh, how the perception of China's BRI, you know, um, the Laos here, over 75%, uh, uh, you know, uh, of the Laotians feel like, you know, um, the China's BRI has provided the much needed infrastructure funding for the region so that, you know, they, uh, they have uh, uh, provided very positive you know, uh, responses to China's BRI uh, seems like a, a, the Laos uh, ranked number one in terms of their happiness uh, with the uh, China's BRI project. So that's why, you know, my case study is uh, focused on um, the Laos and uh, trying to understand not, the, uh, uh, not why China is doing it, uh, because that has been widely uh, studied and also has been covered today. And uh, actually what I'm trying to, uh, you know, uh, better understand is uh, the domestic agencies in Laos and uh, uh, the reasons they want to align their domestic development policies uh, with chi uh, China's BRI, you know, objectives. And uh, also to better understand, you know, uh, what is their domestic calculations in terms of, uh, you know, the implications of uh, uh, borrowing heavily from uh, China to uh, finance their uh, infra infrastructure project. So better understand their domestic interests, the policy preferences, and also the domestic agencies. And uh, um, so um, here, uh, you know, um, the variables that I have looked at to uh, look at the Laos uh, domestic politics is really to look at uh, um, the regime type, the domestic institutions, the coalitions, history, and also leaders' uh, policy preferences from all these aspects. And I'm going to just, uh, uh, you know, uh, to uh, share with you my findings uh, uh, really quickly. And, uh, um, so is this policy shift only a result of China's ambitious Czech diplomacy? I argue it has primarily been driven by the conscious policy choices made by the Laotian government based on one, Laos embraces a very similar development approach as China with a very strong focus on infrastructure investment. And two is that the Laotian government needs the capital and investment which you know, can only be met by China. Different from other, uh, you know, uh, middle powers in the region in Southeast Asia, they do have, uh, you know, a lot of alternative source of capital, for example, you know, from Japan, from Australia, from uh, uh, the United States. 
uh, or from the European Union. It seems like uh, um, because of its uh, uh, credit rating is very low and that because Laos until today is still one of the uh, low income country in the region, lack of, trans, uh, lack of uh, the government capacity to run the projects also uh, you know, um, lack of the infrastructure at the first place to attract the foreign investment. So it seems like uh, um, they don't really have, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, uh, good attractive alternatives to diversify, uh, you know, um, the investment from China. That I think uh, was one of the very realistic uh, consideration of the Laos government. And the other thing is that uh, uh, specifically to the two major uh, investment uh, uh, projects areas that China has focused on in Laos. One, as uh, you know, both uh, speakers have uh, uh, emphasized, is to build the high-speed rail, uh, you know, from China through Laos to reach uh, Thailand, Vietnam, and eventually Singapore. This north-south connection, and uh, of course. Uh, um, that happens to be also, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, the same as uh, uh, the uh, Laotian government, what they have been talking about for decades, way before China's BRI project or the BRI initiative, which is to turn Laos from the landlocked country to a land-linked country, because the country doesn't really have, you know, uh, much resources and that doesn't really have a seaport to export. So that uh, for centuries has been a, uh, has been considered really as a, a bottleneck for the Laos to continue its, uh, uh, you know, uh, economic development. And second uh, development agenda of the Laos is to make Laos a battery of ASEAN to, by providing the electricity to its neighboring countries. And uh, so uh, getting rich by damming the Mekong, again, you know, has been the, uh, the uh, uh, goal of uh, the Laotian government uh, uh, way before China's BRI project. So before the Chinese investment came to Laos to help finance and construct the dams, uh, the Laos already, uh, you know, started the, the projects of uh, 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 the dams building with the capital from Korea, from Australia, and from uh, you know a number of other countries. So the goal was to uh, build 100 dams across the country by 2030, and uh, with 78, you know uh, by today, you know we're already operational and capable of uh, producing, uh, you know uh, almost uh, uh, 10,000 megawatts of the electricity in Thailand so far has been the largest consumer of uh, um, the uh, electricity generated by Laos because uh, uh, it is still has uh, faced the, the limitation how far they can transmit the electricity from the dams in Laos you know, to the countries in the region. And of course, eventually, uh, um, given the fact that uh, we all know uh, China is facing a very severe uh, electricity uh, shortage, uh, especially the last uh, a couple of months. And uh, um, a lot of factories, they have to face, like uh, they have to shut down the operation for like two days, three days a week. So it's uh, getting really serious. And uh, hopefully, you know, um, Laos as a neighboring country, uh, you know, uh, bordering with China will be able to also supply, you know, electricity to China. That I think was also part of the goals. And the, the two case studies I included in this chapter, one is the high-speed rail, the other is the, the, the dam building. I just want to emphasize one quickly, one thing, uh, besides that uh, this portion of the high-speed rail was uh, completed uh, on uh, Tuesday, so three days ago. And uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, the financing part, I think uh, that is uh, uh, quite interesting because uh, um, overall, this is a six billion dollars, uh, you know, uh, project, and uh, around sixty percent of the train's cost is financed through uh, China's Export Import Bank, and uh, the remaining forty percent comes from a joint venture company comprised of, uh, you know, the three uh, Chinese SOEs 
and uh, also um, they hold 70% of the re remaining stake, where a Lao state-owned enterprise has a remaining 30%. So um, the Lao's uh, financial uh, uh, responsibility prim primarily is the 30% of the remaining 40% of the uh, $6 billion. So the Lao government has allocated $250 million from the national budget and take out a further $480 million loan uh, you know, from China's export uh, import bank to finance its share of the venture, of the joint venture. So that uh, you know, is considered the uh, Laos financial uh, you know, responsibility, the $480 million loan. So uh, the uh, construction has completed 414 kilometers. And uh, the speed will be uh, uh, on average, you know, uh, 160 kilometers per hour. So one controversy here is that uh, for a country like Laos, they don't have any high, uh, they don't have any railways. Do they really need a high speed rail, at, uh, you know, um, to be their first, ra first railway? And the other thing, of course, is, uh, you know, um, if, uh, as we all understand, even though um, building the uh, connectivity, turning Laos from the landlocked to the land linked is the domestic initiative of the country. So, um, however, uh, to what extent this high-speed rail will benefit, uh, you know, the Laotian government or the country or the people, I think uh, is a question we, uh, you know, all have uh, asked here. So this is a picture of the building and the, the construction part actually is quite difficult, very challenging. Uh, the negotiation was very easy because compared with uh, you know, the other two lines showed by Jojo you know, uh, through the Vietnam or through Thailand, this one is very straightforward because it only uh, connects the two countries and the two countries uh, you know, have uh, reached the highly uh, consensus you know, they should uh, get the project done. So uh, uh, the cooperation part has no problem. The negotiation has no problem. And the, the uh, Laotian government actually provided all kinds of uh, uh, support for the, uh, in terms of the policy to uh, give the uh, green lights for the Chinese construction company to build the, uh, the, the high-speed rail. The challenge part uh, in terms of the logistic was uh, the mountains and also the number of the bridges and also the mount, uh, in terms of the mountains, throughout this 400 kilometers, the Chinese construction team had to actually, uh, you know, uh, dig 57 tunnels and over 150 bridges. And uh, also um, they have to be very careful about uh, um, the, the landmines. Uh, from the Vietnam War era. So that was considered the, uh, the challenges of the construction, but the, so uh, by today it has uh, completed. As we can see that this is a celebration and uh, um, the economic uh, benefits of the railway, according to the feasibility studies is that uh, that will increase Laos uh, export to China up to uh, 60% and also increase of the tourists from uh, China to Laos. And uh, um, then also it will create uh, a six, over 6,000 uh, jobs for the railway operation. And of course the uh, spillover effects will also include the, around each one of the stop, the, the, uh, you know, where the, uh, the station is. Um, the Chinese has uh, started investing in the industrial parks. So um, that uh, uh, is considered the, the, uh, the spillover effects. And another case that they have included in the chapter is the, the hydropower projects. And I'm going to be uh, really brief here uh, because of uh, uh, you know, the, um, the time constraints. So I'm going to just uh, quickly say uh, the policy issues uh, associated uh, with the dam building is uh, one, is a dislocation of the people and uh, um, the debt implication and also the environmental concerns uh, in terms of the dam building because uh, of the, uh, you know, um, what we have uh, uh, discussed already, the, 
the ecosystem along the Mekong River and also uh, the uh, typically with a dam building, you know, um, the, uh, uh, that will and has already affected, you know, the water access of the downstream uh, countries. And uh, on the, uh, the last thing I want to uh, mention before I uh, close my talk is uh, this debt implication. And uh, um, for many uh, Western scholars, uh, um, they were, uh, you know, I know um, the whole concept of this debt trap uh, diplomacy was coined by uh, the Indian scholar. And uh, so maybe Laos is a very interesting case to uh, study here because uh, um, so far China has become the largest lender to Laos, oh, uh, uh, a total GDP of $20 billion. And it has, the country already has accumulated uh, uh, $12.6 billion foreign debt. Among the $12.6 billion uh, foreign debt, uh, China accounted for almost half, $5.9 billion. And as of uh, June 2020, Laos res foreign reserve has dropped to $864 million, insufficient to meet its uh, debt obligation uh, you know, um, to, uh, even by the end of this year. So uh, Laos is drowning in debt with at least $500 million due this year and another $1.1 billion coming due each year from 2022 to 2025. So this is already uh, happening and a lot, uh, you know, of course, a few solutions we can foresee. One, of course, is the debt relief through the uh, renegotiation with the uh, Chinese government. Another is just to uh, transfer some of the, uh, uh, the management uh, uh, you know, rights for the, uh, for the SOEs, the, uh, the share of the SOEs from the Laotian side to the uh, Chinese side. That could be another way. But overall, um, when we uh, think about this, uh, uh, the Laos as a small, uh, low-income country uh, heavily uh, you know, in debt with China, um, instead of, uh, uh, you know, unlike uh, many, other kind, uh, many other scholars, they have worried about how Laos can pay back. And uh, uh, based on my interviews, my field work in Laos, actually the government officials there are not very worried because they said, uh, you know, they must be able to uh, figure out a way through the bilateral negotiation with the Chinese government. So uh, they foreseen the problem, but uh, they think they can uh, figure out a solution. But what I believe is more worrying, of course, is uh, you know for a country with uh, little leverage, and that uh, they will become more more dependent, you know, on China, and uh, because of this additional um, uh, the debt obligations. With that, I'm going to stop and uh, um, stop sharing. Great. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Wei Liang. And that's uh, an excellent coverage. So I'm going to uh, open out to the questions uh, from the audience. Before that, I'll just like to start with one question in the reverse order to Professor Wei Liang. Uh, the chapter on Laos was very, very interesting. and. Uh, uh, that applies to all the other countries, Cambodia, Thailand as well. But I think the Laos is, uh, given the least developed status in, in, uh, amongst all those countries, uh, you bring out two aspects. One is the political uh, leadership affinity, given the past history to Chinese, and becomes easier for China to actually convince or get influenced by China to their development process. Certainly, the infrastructure development, uh, you know, the massive uh, uh, rail uh, networks and road networks that are being built and the dams that are being built is going to contribute to a lot of development. But the issue is with respect to the management of the debt and that you, uh, you know, you highlighted. So laws, you bring out that they are very confident that the development that takes place in that time frame will grow enough uh, you know, economic growth will be materialized to be able to take care of and address the debt issue is the confidence that the leadership shows. But I bring, uh, my question is, the, in, that con uh, in that background, most, uh, in most cases, the Chinese take over management of the, some of the projects. 
which is for a long period of 50 years and above or 40 years and above. For example, this high-speed rail network, it will be in their hands for 50 years. And, uh, and therefore, uh, the uh, ratio of their revenue that they get, gather is close to 90% or you know, it, it varies from uh, various country to country. Hamad Dota in Sri Lanka has gone for 99 years, Gwadal for 43 years. You know, this is a kind of uh, you know, strategy that's being played out. So this is what the Americans call it as a, a predator financing process. And how do you think these countries will be able to cope up with this, given the you know, constant pressure that they would have? And will economic development grow is sufficiently to be able to you know, address this part? Um, thank you for the question. Really important question, actually, indeed. And uh, um, I, of course, uh, there is a very wide regional variation. Uh, the situation from one country to another uh, is very different. And uh, as you just uh, very uh, you know, uh, uh, correctly pointed out uh, the small, the three uh, low income countries, the least developed countries, Myanmar, Cambodia, and uh, uh, Laos are facing a bigger and greater challenge. And uh, uh, because uh, their capacity to uh, pay back, but also their uh, uh, overall, the, uh, you know, the, the government leadership, uh, you know, um, the uh, effectiveness of uh, the uh, domestic governance, I think is uh, also under the question here. And uh, um, specifically talking about Laos uh, that, uh, and uh, their plan to pay back, I think uh, um, uh, everyone knows uh, uh, today is already like the mid uh, October and uh, um, the country is already on the verge of a, a sovereign default. So, um, what uh, I would, uh, the, my I guess my best assessment is that uh, um, the countries, they are bordering with China. Uh, the political stability is very important and their continued support to China's BRI is very important. So for that reason, Chinese government is uh, 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 you know, more willing to renegotiate the terms of the repayment. And uh, uh, for the case of uh, uh, the uh, law specifically, I would uh, argue, you know, the renegotiation, as you have said, uh, uh, to extend from 15 years to 99 years management could be one approach or one direction that might be uh, taking. But also, I think another thing is that uh, the Chinese government is also very cautious about the criticism of this debt trap. Uh, a diplomacy. Indeed, uh, in fact, actually, uh, based on my interviews, uh, uh, some uh, Chinese uh, government officials also said that they, the reason they couldn't agree with this uh, uh, blame is that, uh, you know, as a creditor, they are running a greater risk, not, uh, you know, um, um, because they are lending the money, so they should uh, be more worried about if uh, the borrowing countries can pay back or not. So it's never their intention to acquire like uh, the strategic assets because of those countries are in debt. So that at least is, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, the, I, what I would say is that the debt issue is, uh, 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 you know, both sides are fully aware and it seems like uh, the tacit agreement is that it will be settled uh, more, uh, politically than economically. Thank you. There's one more issue that I want to raise and I'll, in the meantime, I invite uh, the audience to raise their questions. So if anybody wants to ask directly, you can raise your hand using the uh, provisions available in the uh, issue. You also covered the dam building frenzy in Laos and uh, the energy requirement of all these countries from Thailand down to Vietnam is going to continually increase as the development, uh, you know, increases in the Mekong region, uh, given the, uh, you know, uh, the pressure that's now increasing the world over against thermal power plants and coal-based power plants, which China has been doing a lot. Now they are actually focusing on raising energy through hydro, uh, uh, you know, through the dam building and the hydro power. Uh, will that not be a huge environment damage and ecological damage, given the fact that? It's an established fact that uh, dam building ultimately kills the river and kills the uh, resources in the river over a long period of time. 
and and mekong is the uh, world's second biggest uh, you know second uh, uh, richest fishing reserve as you point out in your chapter as well um definitely i i think i totally agree with you i think that, that uh, actually uh, in that regard especially you know the environmental concerns uh, should uh, be shared and uh, also uh, the downstream countries uh, especially thailand uh, i think has started to uh, revisit their uh, initial support for the dam duty in Laos and uh, the, uh, you know, being the, uh, the biggest uh, consumer of uh, the electricity uh, generated by uh, the dams in Laos. You know, a lot of NGOs domestically, also the global NGOs have started to voice their concerns. And, uh, um, but I think a fundamental issue here is that uh, uh, for a country like Laos, uh, you know, without uh, uh, much of the resources and as uh, facing this uh, great development challenge, they have identified, you know, the Mekong River is something, you know, um, that they want to uh, utilize and take advantage of uh, their strategic location and uh, um, to uh, build the dams. So they have, uh, you know, invested heavily on that and they're not going to stop. But overall, I think the, the question is bigger than Laos or than the, uh, it's, uh, or than the dam building. It's really about uh, globally. Uh, as we know, the World Bank or the ADB has uh, stopped financing uh, uh, this kind of uh, more controversial uh, dam building uh, in many uh, parts of the world. Uh, but uh, uh, for the developing countries, if, uh, you know, uh, on the one hand, they have to meet um, the uh, their glo uh, the climate change, you know, the emission reduction uh, goals. On the other hand, they want to develop their economy. Again, they don't really have many uh, good alternatives. And uh, the, uh, the electricity generated from water doesn't, uh, you know, uh, uh, cause the global warming. So they consider this as uh, one of like the, the better choices uh, in terms of a uh, green, or, uh, you know, or new uh, energy. So um, what I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, this is a serious concern, but the developing countries, not only oftentimes they will have to sacrifice, you know, the environmental uh, degradation for the sake of development. And for this particular case, the dam building, actually many of them have been built under the name of uh, uh, you know addressing the uh, climate change concerns, so um, this is a, a really a policy dilemma here. The paradox, you're right, uh, Professor Sopo. And uh, in the case of Thailand, I mean, there is a big push for modernizing, and I think they're looking at BRI as the best opportunity in that context. Uh, but having been the uh, you know played a primary role and author of you know the. Greater Mekong uh, subregion, and now we are bringing in Lansang, uh, Lansang Mekong uh, cooperation process. Uh, how do you see the challenges with respect to balancing uh, development with climate uh, and environmental damage issue that we just discussed? You got to unmute yourself, Professor. Yes, Ngamu. I unmute myself. Sorry. Thank you for the. A uh, nice presentation about the environmental issue because um, after the dam building in China, you know, and also Thailand also joined uh, Thailand for the electricity general agreement, uh, authority of Thailand or ECAT also joined uh, for the cons to invest for the dam building in, in Laos as well. So uh, a lot of uh, NGO that raised a lot of um, voice and concern to try to protest this one because uh, for the lower Mekong Basin, you know, especially in the northeast of Thailand, got a lot of impact on the, the, the dry season, just like a very low level of um, river in, in, in the area and also ecological uh, damage for the um, fish or, you know, for the, the flooding. Now, Thailand got a lot of flooding in Thailand, especially in uh, Nakhon Si Tamara. Nakhon Si Tamara, it seemed like uh, the, the plateau 
of uh, Thailand, you know, and now it's a lot of funding. So they said because of um, the, the dam, you know, building also from, well, from China and also and the effect from the, uh, the Mekong River and also Moon Chi, another sub. Uh, river of the Mekong in the northeast of Thailand. So now the the level of the water in the uh, dam in Thailand just like uh, you know over and 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 made a lot of funding in the raining season right now. So now Thailand face a lot of um, impact, the bad impact from the environmental. You know, so of course there are a lot of NGO and. Uh, try to 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 uh, how to say force the government uh, make um, how to say the solve this problem and try Thai government you know and I talk to the the, the the Thailand policy maker the Thai government the, the Thai government said they the Thai government try to uh, ask Chinese uh, government in every uh, how to say in every forum to 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 help the problem you know and also use the lmc and also through the bri uh, to 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 raise the, the 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 stage for china to to force china to to uh play their sin sincerity to help the problem, you know. But the and the Thailand try to not involve with with China, just like for the uh, Thai Chinese speed railway, right? Thai not the uh, in way uh bought uh loan any money from, from the AIAB. We use our uh, budget, that's why it's quite slow you know and for construction and also we not the uh how to say uh type our country with the the benefit or the economic of uh, uh china or aib because uh it got we be a face of death you know so um, thailand try not to uh uh, how to say a step into the Chinese depth of the BI for this reason. Okay. Thank you. Christian, I just want to raise one uh, issue. You, of course, the book focuses on, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, in fact, highlights the domestic, balancing domestic development requirements in the Yunnan and Guangxi uh, provinces by uh, looking at their affinity for integration into the Mekong region and with the uh, so uh, ASEAN countries, as we've seen, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, uh, and Myanmar. Well, uh, geopolitics cannot be left out. Uh, and therefore, uh, while Laos, uh, most, some of these countries are, you know, hedging their uh, positions, uh, countries like Laos and uh, Cambodia are fully into the Chinese uh, support system. And uh, China is building an airfield in a place called Dara Sakur, which will give them an significant access and control, uh, you know, uh, proximity to Malacca Straits. And similarly, even through Thailand, you know, the ultimately, the as the high-speed rail gets built up and the East Economic Corridor gets fully materialized, I think it's only a short time for China to get an access to Andaman Seas uh, through Thailand. So uh, how has this been, uh, you know, has this been considered or do you think the uh, local development takes, you know, has been, it's a win-win situation as a strategy you highlight. Is that the focus or then an indirect geopolitical angle to this entire process? Okay. Uh, I mean, I uh, just want to make a comment to the, to the dam building. I mean, uh, Harshit Avashi already waiting a time. So he was, uh, nevertheless, uh, my comment first to the dam building, I mean, Yes, it's important uh, to make more pressure on China to uh, provide more data about the, the risk of water. But what is very often missed in international uh, commenting about the dam building and the lower water level uh, is that from the lower Mekong area, the water for the Mekong from the lower Mekong area, 60% of the amount of water is coming from Laos. 
So from upstream, China is only contributing about 30% or less for the water down um, for the lower Mekong region. So, I mean, when you go to the Mekong River Commission, they can provide you with some data about it because that's a, it's, an, it's an important issue because if you recognize that for the lower Mekong area, so Lao, Thailand, and, and downstream Cambodia, Vietnam, most water is coming from the river, from, from the river uh, network out of Lao, then the picture becomes a bit a different one. But it, says it should not say that important to make more pressure on China to release more data about uh, uh, water release on the dam upstream. But it should also be recognized that we have to look for other issues as well. After all, 60% of the amount of water generated in the lower Mekong area is coming from Lao, uh, from the river network in Lao, which also means if Lao is doing more dumping, it's restricting more of this water. And it means uh, water not from the Mekong itself, from rivers flow, uh, running into the Mekong. So that is uh, when you look to it. So that's just as a comment. I mean, if you look to the EEC, when, when I understood this right, and the wider context of uh, Malacca Street, and if you go down to the Isthmus in uh, Southern Thailand, uh, there are now plans to, to make a, a road network, a road train network, uh, to offer the opportunity to get around Malacca Street. And I mean, the, the project is already there for a very long time. I mean, so up, I mean, now when it started, I mean, the idea, I think it's almost 100 years old. But when I re recall it rightly, it was, I think, one month ago, or less than a month ago, where I read the last time some uh, in, got information about the government, about the Isthmus project, and they now signed some contracts to get the first land for building the railway. So it seems, or they really became, the government becomes more serious in considering this because they would have to build two harbor area, two harbors, one on the on the um, uh, Eastern side. So on the Gulf of, of Siam, Gulf of Thailand, and the other on the Araman Sea on the other side. And the, uh, the railway and the motorway system, but it seems the government becomes more active and more serious about it. The question is to what extent international, international uh, trade companies would, would see this as an advantage because they have to unload and reload uh, the container ships. But on the other hand, we now Malacca Street is completely full of ships. I mean, some people say it's just a time, not if, but only when a major accident happened in the Malacca Street, because it's just too many ships uh, and too much cargo going through it. So, but I, but I don't think the Isthmus uh, is, is part of the Belt and Road Initiative. So, up, um, do you have more information about it? But to my knowledge, that's a Thai project. So, uh, in this way, it's maybe less related to the Belt and Road Initiative, but it's may be part of the whole development of South, uh, of uh, um, sub-regional Southeast Asia. And Sorry. I think there's some link to be made to the EEC that was mentioned in the in the report I read, but I don't think EEC. that's too, too closely related to Belt and Road as such. Sorry, this, this project is not the part of the BRI. You know, yeah. it's a part of an ASEAN master plan project that that yeah, this is what to, I mean. to, yeah. to fit into that that china want to fit into the asean pan uh, uh asean pan project about the uh, connectivity to okay. china to the asean and uh, yeah. can 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 I, can I say like uh, when you say like uh, the the 60 percent of water in 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 south north east of thailand come from uh, yes i know that but the thai government realized that the chinese uh support a lot of them building in lao that why they want to stop Chinese to support Lao to build a dam because now World Bank and uh, Asia Development Bank finished uh, support, finished funding for the dam building in Lao already. As I talked to the, um, the, the ADB um, or uh, ADB piece, uh, 
of Thailand, you know, the, the ADB stopped funding for the yeah. dam building in Thailand already, in, in Laos already. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of criticism, but on the other hand, Laos had the policy as Vai mentioned, and is generally recognized, Laos want to be, became the battery of Southeast Asia. Yes, and from, yes, that's and, right. And from the Lao perspective, uh, they say, we do not have much resources. The only resource what we have is water. And with the, with the possibility of generating electricity, we then can found different uh, developing project within Lao. So from the Lao, Lao perspective, which makes um, some sense to say pushing for dam building because they say we don't have any other resources. But right. even the dam building, uh, it's a problem within Lao because then you would have to ask if Lao does the dam building, generate the income, who in Lao, which part of the population will get the income generated from the electricity which is sold? Because the people who may experience the, the negative impact on the on the Mekong and other rivers, not necessarily the most poor part of the population in Lao. The most poor ones are in the hillsides, where they may be less affected from dam building. But if you think on the Lao government, where to spend the money for development project, you would have to go to the mountain hillside. Okay. You know, so one part of the population may suffer from building, from the dam building, but the money is going to different part of the population. So that's also the domestic issue within Lao, how, how you distribute the potential income from the dam building. I mean, from the selling of the electricity. Thank you, Christian. We'll last yeah. for somebody is raising a hand. Uh, uh, oh, that's yours only. Okay, fine. So, am I audible, sir? Harshita Vasi, ah, yeah. start, sir? Yes, yeah. sir. Please so, go ahead. Hello, everyone. My name is Harshita Vasi. I'm a student of Madras University, of India. So, first of all, I would like to thank you all for giving us this great opportunity to interact and for such good presentations. So, coming back to my questions, I have two questions. Uh, so first one is, what are the hidden depths and major implementation challenges on China's Belt and Road? And my second question is, does the Belt and Road have a future in Taliban Road, Afghanistan? Okay, with uh, this uh, book and okay, fine. I uh, leave uh, leave the freedom to the uh, panelists. Uh, uh, quick short answers, please. We are running out of time. We have we have exceeded the time. Go ahead. Uh, Sorry, I didn't catch it with Afghanistan. What he asked with Afghanistan? So, sir, my question was, does the Belt and uh, Can you speak a, a bit future? louder? Yes, sir. Sir, does the Belt and Road have a future in Taliban Road, Afghanistan? Okay. I mean, let's stop the... That's outside the uh, uh, topic, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's outside the topic of the book, but... I, I mean, the only response I can say for the time being, we don't know what's happened. Because for the time being, I mean, China made some approaches to the Taliban even before they came in the government, a week before uh, they met the, uh, some of the leaders, they had some uh, diplomatic discourse. But so far, China did not uh, accept the Taliban as the new government in Afghanistan. So in this way, it's not different to the other major powers. Uh, and I think it's not the secret that, um, I mean, China is concerned with a part, a, the possible spillover into Xinjiang because there is some talk of, a, I mean, not secret because everyone is talking about it, of a potential military, Chinese PLA, so Chinese military installation in Tajikistan on the border of Tajikistan, Afghanistan, China. And this uh, uh, Tajikistan saying we don't have a military a Chinese military position here. There is some indication that some building was uh, build work is going on. But again, it would not be like an extension of a Chinese military power into Central Asia in general. In general, but it, again, it's in a, in a specific corner on the Tajik, Tajik and Afghan border and uh, Xinjiang to prevent radical forces or influence spilling from getting from Afghanistan into Xinjiang. And it may also undermine, uh, underline China's attitude to uh, the Taliban government in Afghanistan. But I mean, from the time being, 
that's uh, still a very fluid situation. But on the other hand, you could say with the Taliban coming on power that India did lose some of its influence. It was able of building up with the previous Af Afghan government. Thank you. So uh, there is a I kind think, of shifting, but how it will work out, I think it's too early to call because it's, a, it's an ongoing process. Okay, thank you, Christian. I'll thank, thank you so much. You. Thank you so much. Uh, there's one question from Mr. Um, uh, Mishra. What's the agreed uh, system of mediation if China and Laos are not able to come to agreement for rescheduling debt and restructuring the companies? I think it's been discussed, but anyway, I'll leave it to Professor Vilian if you want to answer that. Sure. Um, thank you for the question. And uh, uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier, I think uh, uh, the mediation probably won't be necessary because uh, uh, from both sides, they don't want to escalate the issue. They don't want to make it, uh, uh, you know, a, a like a bad example of China's BRI, the debt trap diplomacy. And uh, because both countries are socialist countries and uh, they not only have a lot of uh, the government to government interaction, but nowadays they also have a lot of uh, party to party interaction. For example, you know, um, the, uh, many of the uh, government officials in Laos, they uh, attended the uh, training at the, the party school in China, in Beijing and or in Yunnan province. So I think uh, uh, Laos uh, has been considered as, uh, uh, as I mentioned, you know, the Chinese government feels like uh, regardless, they want to maintain the political stability to make sure the Laotian government will continue to support China's BRI project. So that is like a bigger, uh, more strategic goal of uh, the Chinese government. And under that goal, they are more willing to I would say, you know, renegotiated that the terms of the repayment were to write up some of the debts, I won't be surprised because they don't want to make it, uh, you know, it's already a major criticism of China's BRI to ensure, you know, the success of the BRI globally. Um, they don't want to, you know, make a big case out of a uh, 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 loss uh, that repayment. Thank you. And uh, so we've come to the end of our, we've exceeded the time, but we've, it's been a wonderful uh, you know, session. And I thank the panelists uh, for this excellent uh, exposition. Let me invite your final comments on uh, just a very, very short comment. Uh, is that uh, taking a leaf out of Palestine's uh, you know, world economy analysis of the colonial period and subsequent system with the Bretton Woods system, uh, will the Chinese BRI suck in the smaller countries, particularly in Southeast Asia and, and rest of Asia, into its orbit and make them dependent on the Chinese economy, which will become then the core economy. Uh, start off with Professor Lian. Yeah. Well, I, I think that was part of the goal. Um, part of the goals of uh, the BRI was to diversify China away from its uh, economic dependence, especially you know, its exports to uh, the U US market. And the, the BRI actually started uh, uh, a couple of years before the US-China trade war and the, uh, you know, all, all the uh, discussions we currently have on the uh, decoupling. So I think uh, domestically in China, the Chinese scholars would say, look, exactly for this reason, we wanted to you know, launch the BRI project because we wanted to uh, you know, be able to diversify uh, you know, China's economic ties. And uh, uh, the BRI is not really not just about the Southeast Asia, it's about China's own version of the globalization. That is to exclude the United States, but mm -hmm. to uh, incorporate everybody else. And primarily, you know, the final destination of the BRI, both the, uh, the uh, maritime, the Silk Road, and also the, uh, through the land is uh, to reach out to Africa and the European Union. So I think definitely, you cannot be, uh, you know, strengthening the economic ties to develop new markets, to solve the domestic, or, uh, you know, overcapacity issues, to, uh, you know, help uh, the uh, uh, Chinese construction company, not just the building the, uh, the, the physical, you know, the high-speed rail mm -hmm. or the, uh, the building the dam, but uh, increasingly the digital Silk Road to help 
uh, you know, to build uh, the uh, the tele uh, through the telecom uh, companies investment, uh, the digital uh, you know uh, Silk Road. I think that's also uh, getting bigger and bigger. Thank you, uh, Professor Ngrampuan. So, uh, uh, I could respond to it. Can I uh, yes, share? Okay. Sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. 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 Sorry. Yeah, I, okay. yeah. Yes. Um, I, I agree. Yeah. Yes, and I agree with the Professor Wei that um, China want to expand their economy and both it. To, to, to the world and also um, expand their um, domestic economy and also their construction and labor. And, and they also want to uh, invest not only in Southeast Asia and also through Europe and uh, South uh, Asia. And now uh, with the uh, um, COVID pandemic, uh, we got the problem with um, um, the, the, the change of the, the, the production of the chain for the industrial form because now a lot of the uh, industry stuck for, 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 the, for the product from China cannot uh, expand to the world. So now for the car industrial and also not, not also for the car industrial and also for the electrical industry from China, you know, that China want to be, and also for the, the uh, IT and also from the technology, that China want to be the expand their power and uh, to get to the world economy. Yeah, thank you. Come to the end of this uh, evening session. Rupal, uh, can you just uh, do the word of thanks? And thank you very much for each of the panelists. It's been a wonderful, you know, it's a pleasure interacting with you all. Rupal, all Thank you, sir. Thank it you. It gives me immense pleasure thank to deliver you very much. thanks for this extremely insightful discussion. And we thank all the panelists for accepting our invitation today, despite their busy schedules and providing us with a better understanding about the Belt and Road Initiative. And I also thank MR Shimadeshwaran for sharing the event and the audience members for being with us here today. And we hope to interact with all of you again in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you for Thank the invitation. You. Yeah.